science and factorial ANOVA. So for number one, you had to read a description and figure out using the flow chart what kind of experimental design, give both the notation and the design type, the researchers were using. So for 1A, what did you come up with for the factorial notation of the numbers? Two by three. Two by three. Okay, so it's two by three something. Okay. And what did you come up with for the type of design? That was both for random group factorial design. Who agrees with that? Okay, before I read, anybody have something else? P by E. Huh? A P and E factorial design? Okay. So to have, if it was a random group spectral design, we would have both would be between subjects, right? And both would be manipulated. If it's a P and E, we have at least, we could have two between, one subject manipulated, or one between <coughs> subject variable and one within. Yeah. I think I'm getting confused by the language on these. So in this first one, the Confederate, it wasn't the rating of very good, okay, or poor, but the job that he did, the variable was very good, okay, or poor, right? I kept going back and forth. Right, okay, so, so we have two IVs here. One is how well, well, actually I should have you tell me, there's one of them, that one of them is the quality of the speech given by the Confederate. And that's either very good, okay, or poor. But that's not the rating that the person is getting, right? Right, they're not giving that. Okay, that's where I was getting. They're seeing one of those three types of videos, and they can rate it however they want. We don't know how they're going to rate it. Where it looks like the researchers are expecting that which condition they're in for the other IV is going to influence how they respond. For example, if the participants have had their self-esteem lowered by being told they didn't do well on the test, or if they've had their self-esteem raised by being told they did very well on a test, that may influence how they respond to someone else. If you're feeling really good about yourself, you might be nicer to other people, right? If you're feeling not so good about yourself, you might be meaner to other people. Okay? Or it could be that if you're feeling good about yourself, you're like, I'm awesome, and you suck. <laughs> right? So you might be more negative towards others because they want to keep yourself feeling good. Or if you're feeling bad about yourself, you might be one of those people who's like, I suck, and I'm sure you're doing a really good job, and I just don't know because I'm just not qualified to about this. We don't know, right? There could be different things going on. But what we've got going on here, we've got one IV is about self-esteem, and the other IV is about the quality of the speech. Now, the kicker in this problem is, what kind of variable is that self-esteem variable? Is it between or within? It's between, okay? Because subjects are either in the improved self-esteem group or they're in the reduced self-esteem group. Okay. Now, is it a subject variable or a manipulated variable? Manipulated. It's a manipulated variable because the researchers artificially manipulate the subject's self-esteem. The self-esteem that the students have during the experiment is not their naturally existing self-esteem. It's artificially manipulated by whatever they were told by the researchers. So what did you have for this variable? Did you have it as a subject variable or a manipulated variable? Okay, so that would explain how you got the P and E factorial design, if you were thinking of it as a subject variable. And I just want to make sure that you understand why we would think of it as manipulated, because the researchers had intentionally changed. They randomly assigned people to either be told they did a good job or they did a bad job. So they're intentionally trying to lift or raise people's self-esteem. Right. Does that make sense? No, no. So it's not the naturally existing level of self-esteem. People could come into the lab and be randomly assigned to either the improvement or the reduction category. 
So this is a manipulated vertical. And speech quality, is that between subjects or within subjects? Between. between, because each person only saw one version of the speech, and it's manipulated because, why wouldn't it be? <laughs> That's what you do with subjects, right? The subjects didn't, they weren't very good, okay, or poor. They were watching a video. They were randomly assigned to one of those. So it's a two by three random groups factorial design. Okay, how about the next one? What's the factorial notation for the next one? Where participants were shown results of 20 polygraph tests. What's the factorial notation? Two by two. Two by two. This is a two by two. IV one has two levels, IV two has two levels. Okay. So what is IV one? The the sex of who? Uh, confederate. The confederate sex. Right? The confederate sex, or the speaker's sex. If I had that for the second independent variable. It doesn't matter. We can do it either way. This is fine. So one of the variables is, oh, it doesn't matter if it's the first one or the second one. One of the variables is the sex of the confederate who made the polygraphs, or the sex of the speaker who made the polygraphs. Now, the reason that I'm emphasizing the sex of the speaker or the sex of the confederate is because I want to emphasize. What is with the guys in the laptops today? I was on it. Yeah, I was on that too. Guys, I know how I feel about that. Sorry. Um, okay. So, you've got. <coughs> I'm old school. Okay, so you've got the sex of the confederate, it's not the sex of the subject. And that's important because this is not a subject variable. And people sometimes think it is. It's like, oh, male and female, that's a subject variable. But it's not because it's not about the subjects at all. We have no idea if the subjects are male or female or genderqueer or what. We have no clue okay, what they are. So this is about the speaker. So that means this is a between subjects variable and it's not a subject variable, it's manipulated. It's manipulated. What about, what's the other IV? It might have been your first IV, might have been your second one, doesn't matter. Whether they lied or told the truth. Okay, so it's like the truth value of the polygraph, or the type of polygraph. They're either lying or telling the truth. Okay. And is that between subjects or within subjects? Within subjects? It's within subjects because all of the participants saw all 20 polygraphs, right? So they had to see all of them. So they had to see some that were truth and some that were lies. Some that were by a male confederate and some that were by a female confederate. They've seen everyone. Okay. Why is, sorry, why is sex of confederate manipulated or so did that? Because s subjects can be uh, experience the different polygraphs, some by males and some by females, in random order. So it's not a subject variable because it doesn't represent any characteristic of the subjects. It has nothing to do with the subjects. It's about the confederate who works for the researcher and what his or her sex was. Okay. So because we can randomly assign the subjects to, to the order in which they experience the polygraphs, they can all experience them in a different order. Yeah. We can randomize that. That means that it's a within subject variable and it's manipulated because we can randomize the order. Okay, thank you. And also it has nothing to do with the subjects. Okay, so it's a two by two. We've got all our variables are all of our variables are within subjects. I thought it was between. Well the first one can't be between, can it? No. Why not? Because they're all seeing both, right? They all see all 20. And when we talk about the 20, we talk about, okay, we've got the one that's whether they're male or female. We've got the one about whether they're telling the truth or a lie. Right? And there are 20 stimuli. 
And if we have four conditions and there are 20 stimuli, that means there are five of each type. And all the subjects see all 20 of those. So the first one is a manipulated variable, can't be a subject variable. That's the gender or the sex of the confederate. And all of the participants see some polygraphs made by men, or made by the man, and some made by the woman. So that means that this one is within. And manipulated. All of the subjects see some polygraphs that were truth and some that were lies. So that's also within and manipulated. So if we have two, this is a two, this is a two, so it's a two by two, everything's within, everything's manipulated, and they saw each condition five times. What do we have? Two by two. What kind of repeated measure? Incomplete. Hmm? Incomplete. It's going to be complete because they saw each condition more than once. There's 20 polygraphs, and they saw all 20. And there's only four conditions. So there have to be five polygraphs of a man telling the truth, five polygraphs of a man telling a lie, five polygraphs of a woman telling the truth, five polygraphs of a woman telling a lie. Yeah? Do any just assume that they're doing randomization of the men and changing oh. order and everything? Yes, there's no reason why. I mean, they have 20, so there's no reason why they wouldn't randomly mix them up. Let me look at the wording here and see if there's... So like the, the last one is the random groups and the match groups. Unless it says match groups, I should assume random groups. Mm -hmm. Unless it says that they did some matching thing, you can assume that they did randomization. Yeah. Um, for how do we know that they went through more than one? So we that they saw each condition more than once. Well, we know that there are four conditions because it's a two by two design. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are 20 polygraph tests. Mm -hmm. So there's four conditions and there's 20 tests. So that means that there are five of each type. Plus five, plus five, plus five, plus five, plus 20. So that means that they, went, they experienced each condition five times? Yes, they experienced each condition five times. There's 20 polygraph tests. Half were made by a man, half were made by a woman. Okay. The man, half of his were the truth and half were a lie. So it means 10 were made by the man, 10 were made by the woman. Right? Okay. So, and then five of the ones made by the man were true, five of the ones made by the man were a lie. Five made by the woman were true, five made by the woman were a lie. And the subject saw all 20 of them, which means we gathered five data points for each subject in each condition. Because they saw, it says they saw all 20. So they had to experience each condition more than once. Five times again. Does that work? What wording in here would make it more clear to you that they saw or would help you identify this design? What additional wording would you want to have to help you identify it? More than one. Yeah, more than one. <laughs> or just that they watched, that they saw the like, it says that if each competitor lied on half and lied or told the truth on the other half, but it doesn't say that the participants knew that the 20 like they they saw both It says participants were shown the results of 20 polygraph tests. I think <coughs> the male and the female thing threw me off because I figured, oh, they went through every condition once, the male lying was telling the truth, but they really went through each twice, like the Confederate lying and telling the truth once and twice. So they went through. Right, so they experienced that we know that the subjects all saw 20 polygraphs. So that's what the first sentence says. Participants were shown the results of 20 polygraph tests. So we know that there's 20 polygraphs that they look at. And they were asked to determine whether or not the person was lying or telling the truth. 
that you understand what these different kinds of designs are. So the researcher gives you a grid, looks like this. It says, I'm going to run an experiment, and I need to run 20 subjects in each condition. How many subjects will I need to recruit if I run my experiment, which is a 2 by 3 factorial? If I do it as a random group factorial, as a complete repeated, or as a repeated measures factorial, or as a mixed group factorial? How many subjects am I going to need? And he asks you to figure it out for him. So if this is a random group factorial, what do I know about variable A and variable B? They're between subjects, right? I know that A is between subjects, and I know that B is also between subjects. Because in a random group factorial, all the IVs are between subjects, right? And they're all manipulated. So I know that this is, a, is all between, all around. So knowing that A is a between subjects variable, what do I know about that? What do I know about like the subjects? You need different subjects for every level of the IV, right? Every condition defined by that IV needs different subjects. So if I have 20 subjects here doing A1, B1, can those same 20 subjects do A2, B1? No. No, I need a different 20 subjects, right? I need a different 20 subjects. I have to put another 20 subjects in that box. Because this is a between subjects variable. So I know that if I've got 20 subjects here, I have to put another 20 subjects in that box. Now, variable B is also between subjects. So if that's the case, can the same subjects who are in level 1 of this variable also be in level 2? No, we can't repeat anybody. Can they be in level 3? No, I've got to have different subjects in every level, right? And we already said. The same subjects who do this can't do this, right? So another 20. Same subjects who do this can't do this. Another 20. So if I have a random groups factorial, I'm going to need 20 groups of 20 subjects, 20 different subjects in every single cell in that grid. So my n for the random groups factorial is going to be 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20, plus 20 or 6 times 20. It's going to be 120. K times N. Six conditions with 20 in each cell. He says, okay, well, what about if I do this? As a random groups, complete, you know, complete repeated measures factorial, how does that change what's going on here? If I'm doing a repeated measures factorial, what do I know about the IVs in my study? They're all within. They're all within. Right? So now this is a within subjects variable, and so is this. Okay? So I've got 20 people here in that first condition. Can those same 20 people, can the same 20 people who are in A1 also be in A2? Yes, because this is within subjects. Means if you're in A1, you're also in A2, because it's within. Everybody experiences all levels of the IV. So I don't need a new 20. I can just say, we'll use them again. That's handy. All right, and now my variable up here, that's also within subjects. So can my same 20 subjects that are here in B1, can they also be in B2 and B3? Yeah. Okay. And we 
already said that anyone that's in level A1 can also be in level A2. So those same 20 subjects can do all the conditions. They experience everything. So in this case, N is just 20. Repeated measure designs typically take many fewer subjects than between subjects designs. Because <laughs> you can you know, reuse them. All right. Now the last case is a mixed factorial design. And the researcher tells you there are actually two options and he wants to know what both of them are. Why are there two options? That's right, because in a mixed factorial design, one of the variables is between and one of them is within. So how many subjects you need is going to depend on whether it's A that's between or B that's between. So if A is between, how many subjects do you need? Tell me where, what should I do? Where do I need to put more numbers? Hmm? A2, B1, here? Okay. Now what? Arrows across. Why am I putting arrows across there? Because this is within, right? Which means the same subjects who are in B1 can be in B2 and can be in B3. Now if I switch it, what do I do? I've got 20 here in A1, B1. Now what? Where do I put more numbers? Here and here? Because this is between, so I need different subjects in every level of B. Okay, now what? Down, down arrows. Because A is within, so if variable A is my between subjects variable, I need 40 subjects, right? 20 plus 20. And if B is my variable that's between subjects, I need 60. you have that are between subjects, that will give you a hint about where to start. Because you notice here we have six conditions where everything's between subjects and it's six times 20. Here we have the between subjects variable has two levels, so it's two times 20. And here you have the between subjects variable has three levels and it's three times 20. And of course, if you have a case where there's no between subjects, everything's within, then you don't have to repeat anybody, so it's just 20. Any questions about that? How many people got it? So you are like, how many people get it now? Okay, that's the important part of it. Now we get it. Okay, good. All right. So I can just go through problems, but I want to know where did you guys get stuck. Are there, is there anything in particular you want me to go over? I don't want to use up all the time going over problems everybody understands. Were there problems in particular that you thought were challenging? Hmm? Huh? Can you go over like one of the, one of the next ones, like either four or five? Go over one of the next ones. Go over, go over. 4A or 4B. Okay. <laughs> All right, you want to go over 4A or 4B? Okay.
Okay, so I will take. <laughs> Which one do you want to do? Four A or four B? Four A. Four A. Okay. So four A says. All right. Here we've got a researcher is comparing. We've got a grid that looks like this. that our critical value for all comparisons is seven seconds. Oh, it told you. That's the last sentence. So it tells you that's basically your F critical. Like that's the value, or your HSD critical, if you want to think of it that way. That's the critical value. That's the value your comparisons have to be bigger than. Okay. All right, so we're going to calculate main effects and interaction using the marginal means method and the subtraction method that we learned in class. So if I want to do the main effect of situation, what do I do? I need to add an average, the top row, so add 24 and 38 together and then take the average, and that's going to give me the mean for ambiguous. So if I do that, what number do I get? I, 31 or 31. 31. There we go. Like you say, 31, like it's an unknowable answer. It's like it's totally knowable. 31. Does anybody not know where that number came from? Uh, you added you add an average. Number. We add 24 and 38 together, and then you divide by 2 because there's two conditions contributing. So we add an average for main effects. For main effects, we add, average, and compare. Okay. So we're going to go through those steps: add, averaging, and comparing. So we're going to add these together, take the average. Okay, now we're going to add these two together and take the average. So if I add 14 and 20 together and then take the average, what do I get? 17. Okay, and then I compare. And what's the difference between 31 and 17? 14. 14. So this is my observed difference, 14. My critical value up here is 7. So is, if my critical value is 7, is this difference big enough to count? Yes. Okay, so that's significant. That means the fact that this is a significant difference of 14 means that there is a main effective situation. What situation the participants were in made a significant difference in terms of their behavior. So now we're going to do what we've been doing all semester. We're going to describe the results. This is kind of like doing a t-test. Okay, we're going to describe what groups we're comparing, what we're comparing about the groups, whether or not the difference was significant, and if it was, the direction of the effect. So we're talking now about situation. So what are the groups of subjects that were created by this variable? Okay. What does it mean to say that the subjects were ambiguous? What was ambiguous about their situation? Subjects needed the experimenter needed all the subjects needed. Right. So the students, you had the subjects in the ambiguous condition, they didn't know whether or not the researcher needed help. The subjects in the unambiguous situation knew that the researcher needed help because he called out and said, I need help. So you want to be clear that you're talking about the subjects in the ambiguous situation 
and you're comparing them to the subjects in the unambiguous situation. So tell me about subjects. Subjects in the ambiguous situation, what, they, what did they do? What are we comparing about them and the people in the unambiguous situation? They took more time to offer help. Okay, so they took more time to offer help. And we can see that because their average is 31 seconds. And the average for the unambiguous situation group is 17 seconds. So the participants who are in an ambiguous situation took significantly longer to offer help to the researcher than subjects who were in an unambiguous situation. Does that make sense? Because for ambiguous, their average was 31 seconds. For unambiguous, the average was 17 seconds. So we can say that people in the unambiguous or the ambiguous situation took significantly longer to respond, almost twice as long to respond as the people in the uh, unambiguous situation. People in the ambiguous situation took almost twice as long to respond as people in the unambiguous situation. All right? That was our main effect. Now let's do the main effect of number of bystanders. So I'm going to add, average, and compare. So if I add and average the scores for the zero bystanders group, what do I get? Um, 38. Hmm? 19. 19. 19. 38 divided by 2, 19. 19. And what about the two bystanders group? 29. 29. Okay, so I've added an average, now I compare, and the difference is 10. Is 10 a significant difference? Yes. Yes. Because I have to beat 7, and I did. Okay, so it means we have a main effect of number of bystanders, too. So what groups are we comparing? What are we comparing about them? We know it's significant because we, we found the difference right there. So then the question is, what's the direction of the effect? Those so subjects who had bystanders present took significantly longer than subjects who didn't have bystanders present. Okay. So subjects who had two bystanders with them took significantly longer to respond to the researcher than subjects who had no one else in the room. You can describe that different ways. You could say subjects who were in the room by themselves responded significantly more quickly than subjects who were in the room with two other people. Any of those things you could find. The important thing is that there were, there were other witnesses and those other witnesses weren't doing anything that had an, a significant influence on the behavior of the subjects. They're like, well, if the other people aren't doing anything, maybe I should just sit here. And then eventually they felt so guilty that they got something. <laughs> okay. So, we got a main effect of number of bystanders such that participants who were in the room with two other people took significantly longer to offer help than participants who were in the room by themselves. Now the interaction. And for the interaction, we subtract in the same direction, and then we compare. So if we're going to subtract in one direction, what should I subtract from what? If I'm going to subtract one of these numbers from the other, which one makes the most sense to you? Subtract the bottom from the top because this one's smaller. That gives us a nice positive number. That's easy, okay? That means that I'm always going to subtract the unambiguous condition from the ambiguous condition, no matter what. Okay? So that means 24 minus 14, the difference is 10. And then 38 minus 20, and the difference is 18. Okay? 
now I compare, and the difference between those two is 8. So is that a significant interaction? Yes. It's bigger than 7. So I have a statistically significant interaction. Now when we're describing an interaction, we tend to focus on the cell. You know, there's one condition, one combination of the variables that pops out. That's what we're really interested in, that special case where we get some interesting combinatory effect. Which of these cells is more different than the others? Which one seems like it, the value is just a lot bigger or a lot smaller than the others? A to B2, this one? This one? This one? That would be A1, B2. Okay. Or you could just say ambiguous with two by one. <laughs> That's okay. You can actually use the labels we have here. You could say the ambiguous people with two bystanders. That works. Okay, that cell, this is 14 higher than the next closest thing. Okay. This is just four different from the next closest. This is six, but this one is really popping out. It's the most different of all the cells there. So what's happening in that cell? Who are the participants in that box that are taking so long, 38 seconds on average to respond? Who are those people? The ones who didn't know he was hurt. Okay, so people, they were in an ambiguous situation, and what else about them? Yeah, that's right, they probably were. So the people who were in an ambiguous situation and were in a room with two other people. So there were other witnesses who were doing nothing. So participants who were in an ambiguous situation and were in that situation with two other people took significantly longer to respond than members of any of the other groups. So that's the interaction. There's a significant interaction of situation and number of bystanders such that participants in the ambiguous situation with two bystanders took significantly longer to respond to the researcher than members of any other condition. They were the slowest. They didn't know whether or not the researcher needed help, and there were two other people in the room who weren't doing anything, so they were like, well, maybe I shouldn't do anything either. You know what that, this kind of research is based on, right? You know the story? The Kitty Genovese story? The woman who was, she was, she was uh, violently assaulted and murdered in front of about 20 witnesses. Who, who all saw each other and assumed somebody else was calling the police. And she was there in an alley, and people were looking out their apartment windows, and they all saw each other through the windows, um, but nobody called. And then the guy left and came back 30 minutes later, and they still hadn't called, and it wasn't until she was actually already dead that somebody called the police. And there was this thing that they were like, everybody figured when the, when the police in, in, uh, interviewed them, they, were, they just all assumed that somebody else would have called. And I thought, and that's what initiated this whole line of research, that sometimes people, when they see other witnesses, they assume the other witnesses will do the right thing. But they just don't want to get involved. It's kind of like sad. Um, and they probably could have saved your life. If somebody would have actually called, everybody figured somebody else would take care of it. It's like when you're driving on the connector and you see a car over on the side of the road, pulled over. How often do you call here when you're on the connector? You never do, right? Why? Because you figure they, the person in the car has a cell phone or somebody else has already called or hero already knows about it. Hero, it's the same phenomenon. You don't call because you figure somebody else already took care of it or you just don't want to get involved. Um, and we all do it. I mean, you're less likely to do that if you're in a situation where you know the, other, the person's not likely to be able to get help any other way. If you know you're probably the person's only chance at help, you probably will do something. But if you think there's a chance somebody else could take care of it, you're just, never mind, move on, don't get involved. That's just people are like that. 
Okay. So, next. Is it okay with that one? Make sense? Did you get it? Did you got all the steps? Okay, so you want to do now five, shall we do five? A. Five A, that was four. We're going to do five B. Five A, five B, I don't care. We're going to do one from number five. That's what I'm suggesting is we might want to do one from number five. Because okay. yeah. number four, number four we're okay with? What did you get? What did you get in terms of the outcomes for number for four B? Did you get a main effect of reward size for four B? We can at least check that. Did you get a main effect of reward size? No. No main effect of reward size. Did you get a main effect of reward delay? Okay. But as long as there's any two are different, we say there's a main effect. Okay. So it's the main effect is the F test, and then which conditions are different is like the post hoc test. Okay. So we still got a main effect. So you say you just say there's a main effect. There's a main effect of reward delay okay. such that this condition was significantly made significantly fewer errors than these other ones. Okay. Yeah. And then for when you're writing it out, really, you can point out which groups. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you could say, for example, there was a significant, uh, there was a main effect of reward delay, such that the rats who received their reward immediately upon exiting the maze made significantly fewer errors than rats who had to wait 10 <coughs> seconds or rats who had to wait 20 seconds to get their reward. Something like that. So that's where you that's where you flesh out what happened in the post talk. Okay. All right, and what about the interaction? Did you get an interaction for reward size and reward delay? No. The differences were all? Yeah, the, well, if you, did, if you look at the comparisons, 10 minus 5, 40 minus 35, and 45 minus 40, they were all 5, 5, 5, 5. And if you compare those, the difference between them is 0. These lines are parallel to each other. They're always five apart. The line for the 20 milligram reward is always five apart from the line for 10 milligrams. These lines are parallel. There's no interaction anywhere. Okay? So, do you want to do 5A or 5B? 5A, with the alcohol photos, the plant photos, the aggression related words, and the neutral words. Okay? So we're going to go through these, and you have to tell me what about the graph tells you there's a main, probably a main effect or not, probably or probably an interaction or not. Um, so let's do the main effect of IV1 phototype first. So if we look at the bar graph, what suggests that there is or isn't a main effect of phototype in the bar graph. What is it about the graph that you would look at to try to figure that out? Uh, the height. Hmm? The height? The height of the bars. The height of which bars? What bars are you comparing to what other bars? Alcohol phototype, plant photo. Okay, so we're talking about phototype. You're comparing the alcohol photo bars the average of the alcohol photo bars to the average of the plant photo bars, right? Because those are the two levels of phototype. So if you compare the average of the alcohol photo bars to the average of the plant photo bars, do they look, you think it's going to be really different? No. No. Probably not. So if it's probably not going to be very different, what does that mean? Probably we don't have a main effect, right? Probably no main effect of phototype. Okay, now let's look at word type in that same bar graph. What bars would you compare if you were trying to figure out if there was a main effect of word type? Um, the common name. The color. Uh, Do it by color, yeah. right? So it would either be the, the combination of the dark bars, if you print it out and it's in black and white, right? The dark bars, compare the average of the dark bars with the average of the light bars. 
If you're looking at a color version, it's the average of the pink bars compared to the average of the yellow bars. Right? So what do you think? If you average the dark bars together and compare it to the average for the light bars, do you think it would be very different? A little bit. So there might be a main effect. There might be. Maybe. A little one. Could be. But maybe not. It's not, it's not a very compelling difference. It's not like a huge difference that's really obvious. Would it be like you wrote, there might be, but it might also be due to the interaction between Oh, people. yeah. That would, that would make me really happy. Okay. And then the next question, of course, is does it look like there might be an interaction? Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there might be an interaction. How do you know? What bars are we, what are we doing with the bars now when we try to figure out if there's an interaction in a bar graph? What are we comparing to try and figure out if there's an interaction? The difference in direction. The difference in direction. So what difference in direction do you look at first? Well, both of them have pink and orange. So the one on the left, I think. Okay, so we start with the alcohol photo. You say, well, the pink bar is much shorter than the yellow bar for alcohol photo. But when we go over to plant photo, the difference in the direction change. The pink bar is now taller, and the yellow bar is shorter and the difference isn't as much. So given that both the difference and the direction have changed, this looks like there's an interaction of phototype and word type. Yeah. On the test, when we're doing this, and you asked like how we know, mm -hmm. would, since the direction is definitely different, do we need to mention the difference? Since in this one, it's not really that different? Um, the direction is clearly the more important thing here, because um, but I don't want people to overlook the role that difference plays because sometimes difference is what shows you there's an interaction and direction doesn't change. So what's important to me on the test is that you say, although the difference is not too much between the, when I do the two comparisons, the direction flip flops. And that's it, you know, where the yellow bar is taller in one case and it's shorter in the other case. And that's what tells us there's an interaction. So I want to know in the best answer will show me that you know both difference and direction matter, but in this case, it's the direction that's really the thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. If for the main effect of word type, mm -hmm. if you had said that there was no main effect, mm -hmm. would that be considered like kind of No, what I'm interested in is your explanation. Okay. So if you said, I'm looking at word type, mm -hmm. and so if I look at the average of the pink bars and compared to the average of the yellow bars, those don't look very different to me, so I would say no. Okay. That tells me you're looking at the right thing. If you said, they look a little bit different to me, so maybe, then that would also be fine. Okay. So my, what, I, what I care about is that you are able to articulate what the characteristic of the graph is that you're using to make your decision okay. and do so clearly to distinguish it from other effects. Does that work? All right. So we did the bar graph. Now let's talk about the line graph. So if I'm trying to figure out if there is a main effect of phototype in the line graph, what am I comparing? What am I looking at? Phototype is on the x-axis, so what am I looking for? The slope of the lines. And what are these lines doing? They're crossing over. One has a positive slope, one has a negative slope. What did we learn about that? When one of them has a positive slope and one of them has a negative slope, they, cancel. they pretty much cancel each other out, and that suggests to us that what? No main effect. Probably no main effect. Because although both of the lines are sloped, one has a positive slope, one has a negative slope, and they probably cancel each other out. So probably not. A main so probably not a main effect. Yeah, there's a fair, probably not a main effect here. What about the main effect of word type? What do we look for when we're thinking about the thing in the legend? The distance apart. Well, we got a problem here. <laughs> because sometimes they're far apart, and sometimes they're right on top of each other. Right? And whether one is high and the other is low depends on which end of the graph you're on. Right? If you're looking over an alcohol photo, a different one is high than if you look over a plant photo. Right? So 
we think about how far apart they are, it seems like, well, those values are going to cancel each other out too. Because, yeah, sometimes they're far apart, but sometimes they're right <coughs> on top of each other. So chances are there's no main effect here either. What about the interaction? This one should be the slam dunk. You think you have an interaction? I like people are, are doing like their superhero moves. <laughs> it's like, yes, yeah, superhero. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely we have an interaction. Right? We've got an interaction. They are completely crossing over, right? We have a crossover effect, crossover interaction. This is the most obvious kind of interaction there is. They literally do intersect and cross over one another. So the fact that the lines intersect, totally cross over one another and form an X pattern on the graph is the most compelling. So we can feel pretty confident that there's an interaction here. OK. Let's talk about, do you need to do the other one, or do you want to go on and talk about the one where you're doing math? Number six? Want to do six? OK. So for six, identify and figure out what degrees of freedom you would use to look up the critical value and then look up the critical value for each effect. You had to calculate F observed and calculate N squared for each effect. So how do I do that when we're talking about a factorial design? This is an independent group's factorial design. So if I were doing this as a one-way, and I were looking up F critical, well, for the DF numerator, what would I use? What would I use for DF numerator if I were to look up a critical value, if this was a one-way between subjects factor? We see one way between subjects to know about. Right, I would use DF between conditions, right? Degrees of freedom between conditions. And what would I use for my degrees of freedom denominator? Within conditions. Now, if I'm doing a two way between subjects, I need to do one for IV1, one for IV2, and one for the interaction. Okay, I've got to look up an F critical for all of those. So what degrees of freedom am I going to use to look up F critical for IV1? Tell me, tell me the name first. I'm not going to use degrees of freedom between conditions. What am I going to use? Yeah, the degrees of freedom for IV1, which would be what on this chart? One. One. This value right here. <coughs> what am I going to use for my degrees of freedom denominator? The within conditions. Within conditions, right. Okay, so that's the same. So in this case, what would that be? 
24. Right, this one over here. So what would I use for degrees of freedom numerator for the main effect of IV2? Two. Two? I would use the degrees of freedom for IV2, right? In this case, that's two. And still use degrees of freedom within conditions for the denominator. What about for the interaction? What do I use for degrees of freedom numerator? Okay, well, IV1 times IV2, you want to be careful here because we're talking about the interaction, right? Uh, so we're going to do IV1 times IV2, so I go here. Right? So I want the degrees of freedom for the interaction. And it's better to say it that way than to say the degrees of freedom for IV1 times IV2, because then what people sometimes do is they completely ignore what's down here and they multiply these to come up with a new number. And it just so happens that works out here, but that is not always the case. The degrees of freedom for the interaction is listed under degrees of freedom in the interaction row. So don't, you don't have to multiply anything. You just want to pick the number. It's just a matter of picking out the number. So, and then still degrees of freedom within conditions. Now for a one-way ANOVA on independent groups, when I calculate F observed, what formula do I use for a one-way ANOVA on independent groups? Yep, the mean square between conditions over mean square within conditions. Right? That's how I get F observed. So what formula do I use to calculate that for IV1? All I'm doing is swapping out the mean square for IV1, and I leave the mean square within conditions alone. Okay, what about for the main effect of IV2? So what do I do? Swap IV1 to IV2. Yep, just swap that out. Okay, and what about for the interaction? What do I do? Use what? Yeah, the mean square. Okay, the mean square for the interaction, right? Because see here, if you took the mean square, these two mean squares to multiply them, you would get something totally wrong, right? So don't multiply anything. Just pick the one that's on there. You don't have to do any multiplication. So the mean square for the interaction okay, over the mean square within conditions. And if I wanted to do eta square, okay. what do I do to get eta square for a main effect of IV1 in a two way ANOVA? In greater than how do I modify this formula to get the right formula for the factorial? Sum of squares IV1 over? Yep. So now we're just going to swap out the right sum of squares for sum of squares between conditions. of the ones we already know for the one-way independent groups ANOVA. Okay. All we're doing is taking the stuff that was between conditions and swapping it out for the relevant similar value for the new ANOVA. So if I'm looking at IV1, all I'm doing is everywhere it says BC, I'm swapping out IV1. I'm looking at main effect of IV2, everywhere it says that, I'm just swapping out the value for IV2. I don't ever use that number and never use the degrees of freedom between conditions at all. And I do not 
Calculate a new value there and use it. Don't do it. That table is complete. It's got what you need. Don't calculate new stuff. Okay. Every semester, I have somebody who calculates new values. You don't need them. They're all everything you need right there. All right. So given that we know this is what we have to have, what did you get for, well, let's just go through the list. So if I'm looking up, we did, let's do these again just to make sure we've got it. We've got IV1, I'm going to use what two values to look up the critical value? 1 and 24. Okay. And when I do that, what do I find? 4.26. Hmm? 4.26? Do you agree? All right, 4.26. Okay. When I calculate the observed value, what numbers am I going to use? One twenty over five, and when I do that, what do I get? Twenty-four. Okay. So if my observed value is twenty-four and my critical value is four point two six, do I have a significant effect? Is twenty-four bigger than four point two six? Absolutely. So there's a main effect of IV one. Definitely a main effect of IV one. What effect size did you get for that? We do the effect size math. 50%, point 0.5, okay, 50%. All right, if I'm looking up the critical value for the main effect of IV2, what degrees of freedom am I gonna use? Two. Two, two and? 24. 24, two and 24, okay. And if I do the calculation for the observed value, for F observed, what am I gonna, what math am I going to do? Uh, 40, divided by five. 40 divided by 5. So F observed is? 8. eight. eight. Okay. And what's my critical value? 40. Did you guys look it up? What was the critical value for yeah. the main effect of IV2? 3.40? 3.40? Okay. So if my critical value is 3.4 and my observed value is 8. Do I have a main effect of IV2? Yes. And what's the effect size? 40%. 40%. Is that a small, medium, or large effect? Large. large. Okay. And for the interaction, what degrees of freedom will I use to look up F critical for the interaction? Two and 24. Not really two over 24, but two and 24. When you say two over 24, it sounds like we're going to do division. We're not dividing anything. It's two and 24. Those are the two things we're going to use to look up the critical value. Then, if I calculate F observed for the interaction, what numbers am I going to use? 30 over 5. 30 over 5. Right now, I am doing division. So it's 30 over 5, 30 divided by 5 means my F observed is? Six. 6. My critical value should be the same as last time, right? Because it's the same degrees of freedom, 2 and 24. So if my critical value is 3 point something and my observed value is 6, do I have an interaction of IV1 and IV2? Yes, I do. And what is my effect size? 30%. 4.3. So on the test, you will have to be able to look at a table like this and pull the relevant values off to do the calculations you need. I could ask you for anything. I could say, tell me what degrees of freedom you need to look up the critical value for the main effect of IV1. And tell me what the numbers are. So you have to be able to tell me. Yeah. How would you do the AP style statement? Okay, it's exactly the same as we did for one-way ANOVA. So if I did, think about how we did it for one-way ANOVA. Say we want to do, we have to do a separate uh, APA style statement for each F test, which means you could do one for the main effect of IV1, another one for the main effect of IV2, and another one for the interaction. So which one do you want to do? Um, interaction. Interaction, okay. 
So you start off with F, just like you normally would, because this is an F test. This is an ANOVA, so we're doing an F test. Then in parentheses, I'm going to put the degrees of freedom I needed to look up the critical value. And what were the degrees of freedom I used for the interaction? 2 and 24. Okay, then equals, and then I put the observed value. What was my observed value for the interaction? Six.